Welcome everyone to the online algorithms session. Um, our, we're going to stick with the format of most of the conference, which is to do these um, five awesome talks in quick succession uh, and save questions and discussion for the end. The talks are um, on a pretty cohesive set of subjects. So I'm hoping that we can have some, um, some high level discussion at the end in addition to uh, questions for particular authors. Um, please feel free to record questions in case you might forget them either to yourself or in the chat. And if they're not answered by the authors there, we will get to them at the end of the session. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Christian from CWI who will give the first talk on metrical service systems with transformations. Take it away, Christian. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the introduction. So this is joint work with Sebastian Bubeck, Nif Buchbinder and Mark Selke. And we are introducing here a new online problem. And before I introduce this new problem, I will give you the definition of an old problem, which is called metrical service systems. So in this problem, we have a metric space M and some initial point P0 in the metric space. And now at every discrete time step, some set is given to the algorithm, some set AT, which we call the feasible region. And then the algorithm has to go and move this point to this region. So if this is the first set AT, and this is the initial point, now the algorithm has to go to this set. And then the next set is revealed. And again, the algorithm has to move there. And uh, the cost of the algorithm is just the distance traveled by this point. And this point, we also call it the state of the algorithm. So this is a very general online problem and loads of problems fall into this uh, class of metrical service systems. So some of them are listed here, but there are still limitations to this class of problems. So um, for instance, it's not possible to change the state of the algorithm uh, without incurring cost. So, it could be that for maybe um, resources appear or disappear, that's changed the state of the algorithm, but we don't want to charge cost to the algorithm for this. So something like this could not be captured by metrical service systems. And also a particular problem that doesn't fall into this class of metrical service systems is the K-taxi problem, which is a generalization of the K-server problem. So in this problem, the, the task basically is to assign taxis to passengers so as to minimize the distance of empty rides of the taxis. So whenever we have a non-empty ride of a taxi, the state of the taxi configuration changes, but we don't want to charge any costs. So this doesn't fall into this class. So to address these limitations, we introduced this new problem, which we call metrical service systems with transformations. So definition is very similar. Again, we have a metric space and some initial point in the metric space. Now at every time step, well, previously we were just given a set AT. Now instead we received some function that maps a set AT to some other set BT. And that is the main difference. So now again, the algorithm has to go to a point in the set AT. And again, the algorithm pays the distance from the previous point to AT. But now we apply this transformation. So now the new state of the algorithm is going to be the image of AT under this transformation. And for this transformation, we don't charge any additional costs. So now the, the state changes without a charging cost. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come already to the main results of our paper. So we show that if the metric space contains n points, and if every transformation is alpha Lipschitz, then the competitive ratio is roughly alpha to the n. So at least when, when alpha is large enough, then these upper and lower bounds here are tied up to this uh, two basically that's inside the, um, well, that's taking the look to the power of n. Um, for the K-taxi problem, which is a special case of this problem, we give a very simple proof to show that the competitive ratio is polynomial at most in N, which is the size of the taxi problem space and in log K. And we also show a result that we find rather surprising, which is that for chasing convex bodies, if you extend this in this manner and you allow contracting transformations between two convex bodies, then there exists no competitive algorithm for this problem. So even though these contractions can only bring the online and offline algorithm closer together, 
the, the competitive ratio is no longer finite, even in two dimensions. And the main problems that we were not able to answer is, well, what are better bounds on finite metrics if we have contractions? So, in, in, well, convex body chasing has an infinite metric space and contraction means it's a one Lipschitz function. So we know from this upper bound that there is a competitive algorithm on finite metric spaces. But if alpha is one, then the lower bound we have here is quite meaningless. It's <laughs> just one. Um, so it seems plausible that there should be a much better um, competitive ratio for the case of contractions, also for isometry transformations. And um, I will not go in detail about the proofs, but I will um, uh, state one idea that uh, we use for some of these results which is if we look at the special case symmetry transformations, which is in particular the case that we have in, in, in the problem. Then one idea is to say, um, well, to try to extend this isometry from AT to BT to a global isometry of the entire space. So if we can do this, then it means the isometry is not really doing anything. It's just a renaming of the points of the space. So if it's possible to extend such an isometry in, in, in this way, then to serve the request, we really just have to go to AT, which is the same we have to go in metrical service systems. And then we just rename the points of the space. So we could then just apply a metrical service systems algorithm to this problem. But uh, this is, um, well, in some cases, this is possible to do, but in general, you cannot uh, expect to be able to do this. One idea, however, is to first extend the metric space M to some greater metric space so that we can then ex uh, expand our, um, well, extend our isometry to an isometry of the global, of the greater um, uh, metric space. So the question here is then, uh, given some finite metric space N, is it always possible to find a super space M hat such that every partial isometry on M extends to a global isometry on M head. And this is indeed possible. So this was shown 15 years ago. Well, actually it's known since 20, since like a hundred years that this is possible. But 15 years ago, it was also shown that if M is finite, then M head is also finite. Um, so what this means is that the problem uh, TMSS with isometry transformation reduces to just MSS on this extended space. And the competitive ratio, because of what is known about metrical service systems, is therefore polylogarithmic in the size of this extended space. The next question then, of course, is what is the size of this extended space? So what is the size of M head? So it would be desirable if there is some function that bounds the size of M head as a function of B. So even though it is known that M head is always finite, we don't know whether such a function exists. What we do give is, uh, well, we, we do answer this question for some special cases, like for special classes or metrics of uh, isometries. And also in th there's a lower bound for some metrics showing that the um, blow up is at least exponential. We, we don't know if there's a better lower bound. So if this was tight, it would mean that there is a polynomially competitive algorithm for uh, TMSS with isometries. So this is one of the ideas that we use in, in this paper in particular to obtain the result for the k taxi problem. And yeah, to get um, yeah, more insight in, into more of our ideas, I yeah, refer to our longer talk or um, of course the paper. So that's it for now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christian. Um... You're the only one I can hear applaud, but I'm sure everybody is actually applauding. Um, so if we could go ahead and change over the screen share to, I think, Kevin. Yes. Fantastic. So you able to see my slides now? Yeah, 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 yeah. We see them. Very good. Cool. So we have. Oh, and I should. Um, mention, I should remind everyone, since Christian brought it up, that all I have watched all the long talks for uh, this session, and they're all awesome, and um, all of you in the audience should check them out. So uh, we have Kevin, I think, from Cologne, and maybe that's correct. I'm not sure. Yes. 
here to talk about unknown IID profits, better bound streaming algorithms, and a new impossibility. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so unknown IID profits, that's short for profit inequalities for IID random variables from an unknown distribution. Uh, so let's first talk about IID profit inequalities. Um, so what's the setting here? Um, yeah, so as input, one's given a distribution on the positive real numbers and uh, natural number n, and then one gets a sequence of independent draws from that distribution, namely n independent draws, also shown up here. Um, yeah, and uh, the task is to select a single one of these draws at the time when this would be it. So let's walk through a short example. Maybe first uh, this draw. So this draw is reviewed first. Let's say it's eight. Uh, and now one has to decide whether to select this as a single one of these draws or not. Uh, let's say one doesn't. And then this one's revealed. Let's say it's also not selected. And then this one's revealed. Let's say that's, that is selected. And since only a single one of these draws may be selected, all other draws are rejected. Okay. Uh, we refer to the, the index of the draw that's selected, also as the stopping time, uh, which uh, is also denoted by tau. Okay, so that's a very clean setting. Uh, what does the profit inequality say about the setting? Um, it says, so it compares uh, the expected value that can be selected in that setting with uh, the expected value of the profit. So the profit just uh, sees all the values in advance and just goes and uh, selects the largest one of these values. Mm. And then the profit inequality says how these terms compare. So uh, in particular, in this setting, um, it says that the expected value that one can get in that setting is at least uh, roughly 0.745 uh, times the, the expected value of the profit. And that is uh, best possible. OK. Um, just a short notice on uh, mm, why that's interesting or why people look at this other than that being a clean mathematical model. Um, well, it's, um, yeah, it's important in mechanism design, algorithmic pricing and uh, beyond the worst case analysis of online algorithms. So that's actually a very simple online problem of selecting the maximum value, right? All right. Um, and now the next model that we actually look at, um, it, it changes um, this part of the model, that, namely that the distribution is known, which is arguably somewhat unrealistic. Maybe in practice, one only knows sample from, samples from that distribution. And that's yeah, an assumption made by Azar Kleinberg and Weinberg, and um, more specifically in the ID setting, and a previous paper of ours, or actually a subset of the authors, um, yeah, uh, in EC19. And the goal is to essentially recover such a result that I had on the previous slide. Um, again, comparing the, the value of the um, decision maker, only knowing these samples now instead, instead of the actual distribution um, with the value of the product. Um, yeah, we actually look at, slightly, at a slightly simplified setting where n is large, so the number of draws is large. And uh, also the number of samples is linear um, in the number of, uh, of draws. And yeah, one can argue, which I won't do here, but do in the long talk, uh, that that's the most interesting setting. All right. Um, so what, what's known about this uh, guarantee as a function of the number of samples. So we have beta times n samples. Uh, and it's known that this the function that um, describes that guarantee from the previous slide uh, is between is in this gap here between these two functions. A particularly interesting case is beta equals one, so you have as many uh, samples as you have actual draws in which you can stop. Um, yeah, so these are the bounds from the EC19 paper. They have since been improved, um, and that's what was known previous to to our work. Um, so what do we do? Well, we extend the state of the art in three directions, one of them being uh, improvement of the state of art guarantees from the last slide. So we'll show you in a second uh, how these improvements look and how we achieve them. Um, what we also do, um, so we introduce a streaming version of the model 
um, that addresses another arguably an unrealistic assumption, namely that all the data points can be stored. So maybe the uh, yeah, number of, um, of samples that you have is actually large and you cannot store them all. Um, yeah, that's actually another motivation of, for the class of algorithms we look, uh, look at uh, for, the, for the first contribution um, because we can implement these algorithms uh, in that streaming set. Uh, last contribution is uh, that we extend this um, impossibility. So the very uh, the point on the very left in that um, diagram that I just, just showed, uh, we extend that to a more general set. Okay. Um, but in yeah, the remaining three minutes, I will talk about uh, this first contribution and yeah, how we achieve that. Uh, yeah, so the new um, the new bounds are shown in red. So that looks a little in incremental maybe, but uh, yeah, let me tell you why I think it's cool. So I think it's cool that um, so we get we get tight bounds for a whole range range of beta. So um, that's actually, yeah, those are, except for the limit and this uh, beta equals zero case, those are the first tight bounds. And also um, some of our bounds are tied for a natural class of algorithms. So what's this, the class of algorithms? Well, it extends a class or it ex extends an algorithm from that EC19 paper. Um, so that algorithm does, uh, what that algorithm does is at each time step, it selects, uh, uh, uniformly random subset of size n minus one from all values uh, it has previously seen and takes the maximum of the set and sets this, this as a threshold for accepting the next value. Okay, and we um, look at a generalization where we essentially allow to select any uh, a subset of these size at any point in time. So we have a function that maps time to how large of the subset uh, you're allowed to um, select. Yeah, that's a lemma we use uh, to analyze this class of algorithms. Uh, so let's look at these functions. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's the number, the size of the subset is a function of, of time. What we in fact do is we look at the continuous variant where time becomes continuous. And then for some specific n, what we do is we equidistantly sample that function. And from that, we uh, recover the, the actual sizes that we use by rounding. All right, um, so yeah, this is less of an intimidation slide than long talk, uh, but here I won't say much. Um, what I want to show you is what the optimal function in the end looks like. So that's in fact uh, the optimal function that we allow, that we compute from this problem using uh, variational calculus. Yeah, so this, this function gives you the, the best sizes of uh, subsets um, to select uniformly at random at each time step. And um, yeah, when we add bounds on the number of samples, uh, we also get at least conjecture best function, but that's a strong conjecture. Okay, and we, we do so for, for any upper bound on the number of samples. I will explain, yeah, these functions a bit more in detail in the long talk. Um, what I should mention is that from some point onwards, so uh, for 0.58 times n samples and less, uh, we only get a line for that function. And that's also the point in time, uh, yeah, a point where we um, get uh, tight bonds. So for every lower uh, number of, of samples, we also get a tight bond. All right, um, so that's all I want to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, could we go ahead and switch the screen over to Spiros? Yes. Hopefully, Spiro should be able to share. Fantastic. We have uh, Spiros with the talk, uh, online search with a hint. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So I will present uh, some results uh, on a new framework for online search. I should say here that if you would like to see some motivation that comes from uh, action movies, you are invited to, to look at the, to take to have a look at the long video. But uh, this is a short talk, so for now I would like to say that what we are trying to accomplish in this work 
is we would like to be able to leverage hints in a setting in which we have a searcher who wants to locate an immobile hider in a given environment. Uh, right. So I start with uh, so we start with the simplest environment you could probably imagine, which consists of uh, the unbounded line with some origin point, and there is a hider at some unknown distance, and at some unknown, unknown point, essentially, in, in, on the line, it's either to the left or to the right, and there is a searcher. So the searcher would like to look at the hider. It doesn't know exactly where it lies. So what it does is it follows a search strategy until it eventually hits the target. And uh, the search strategy is completely defined in this simple case by the, by the length of, uh, of, by the length of these traversals back and forth. Um, this is a problem that, of course, is known in operations research as a um, as linear search problem. In computer science, we know it more informally as the cowpath problem. And the objective for the searcher is to minimize the so-called competitive ratio. It is the worst case ratio of the distance that the searcher had to traverse in order to locate uh, the target divided by the optimal distance it would have to take, it would have to traverse if it knew exactly where the hider was hiding. So there is a, there is a very well-known result that using a double strategy, we get an optimal deterministic competitive ratio equal to nine. And this is a problem that has been discovered and rediscovered and, and extended many, many times uh, in, across many disciplines. So in this work, we're looking at, the, we, 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 we're following the framework in which there is some additional information that is given to the sensor. And this information is given in, in, a, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the form of a hint and in fact, we consider two possibilities. So one possibility is that the hint comes from a trusted source, which means that it's always guaranteed to be correct, or the hint is, uh, comes from a malicious source, from an untrusted source, and therefore it can be generated adversarially. And now the, co the competitiveness of the search strategy um, is defined across two metrics. The first uh, is uh, what is called the consistency. It's a co competitive ratio if the hint is correct. The other is the robustness, the competitive ratio of the hint is adversarial. So I should say here that uh, what we're really adopting the untrusted advice framework that uh, we presented in the last uh, ITCS, but I should point out here that uh, we, now we are, we are in a specific application and as you'll see, we have very specific hints with very specific semantics. And also the, there's, a, a, there's a very active field on online uh, computation about enhancing online algorithms with uh, untrusted pre predictions. Um, so here's a simple example. If the hint is a direction of the search, so one possibility is for the sensor to always trust the hint. Uh, but if the hint is incorrect, it could be walking towards one direction uh, infinitely to, to, the, to the infinity, so it could be infinite competitive. The other is to ignore the hint. And you would be 9,9 competitive. So the question is, uh, which one of these two is best? The answer is, uh, they, they cannot be compared, but we live in a two-dimensional space, so we can apply the framework of, uh, of Pareto efficiency in order to be able to, to compare strategies. Okay. So uh, in this work, we basically consider three types of hints. So the first, uh, the first type is the exact position of the target. So the hint tells you where precisely the, the target lies on this infinite line. The second is the direction of the cells whether it is to the left or whether it is to the right of the, uh, of, of the origin. And the third, the most general is that it comes from a k-bit string. Um, uh, so, so, so this is a more general framework. It's, it is very much related now to the advice complexity in an untrusted um, setting. And even with one bit, you could, uh, you could give a pretty much a lot of information to the center. So one, one bit would induce a partition of the line into two spaces, into two subsets. And that could be useful for, uh, for the sensor. Uh, I, will very, I will very briefly discuss just the first one, which is perhaps the easier, um, that highlights some of the techniques here. What happens if the hint is the exact position of the target? Well, what happens here is that we follow a geometric strategy. Uh, this is, uh, these are the classes of uh, strategies that work well in practice. Um, so the ith, uh, in the ith iteration here, we we'll locate, let's suppose that in the ith iteration, we we'll locate uh, the hider, so we go beyond the hider, so we find the hider uh, using a length equal to B, BR to the I. So what is BR to the I? Well, BR is defined here, but there is a, there is a nicer way of thinking about, uh, about it. It is the largest uh, base I could use in a geometric strategy and be always R robust in the worst case. 
So I'm trying to walk as far as I can in its iteration without, without sacrificing robustness. But also this is a little bit wasteful towards the end. So what we do is really we shrink it to make sure that we hit the target precisely at, at the right moment. And once you have this idea, the upper bound is very easy to analyze the strategy in this framework. It takes a little bit more, uh, more effort to show the lower bound. If you, uh, and indeed we argue that this is the best you can do, you get Pareto optimality. Uh, and to show that this, we need a helpful lemma. We need to be able to say something about the relation between the lengths of, of these searches in any robust strategy. In particular, we need to say that the ith length um, cannot be too big in comparison to the i minus uh, one. And once you get this, this, this follows um, pretty easily. Uh, I will only give a summary of the results we get for the other two settings. So for the setting in which the hint is the direction, uh, we obtain again Pareto optimal strategies. Uh, and in terms of techniques, uh, we relied on some nice uh, results based on functionals by Skurin and Gall, but we extended them in a, in a parameterized way. And uh, this allows us to get pretty better results uh, in the following sense. So using these previous results by themselves, what we could show easily or what was already known was that uh, the average of the, of the, uh, of the robustness of the consistency is nine. At least not. Okay. But what we saw is that if you want to approach to, 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 to make the consistency much better, in particular, as you go towards five, the robustness skyrockets. Yeah, it tends to infinity as, as, as the consistency goes to five. So we get some better uh, lower bounds in this sense, which are optimal. And in terms of K bit strings, uh, well, here we do not get tight results, but we get a collection of upper and lower bounds. Um, I, should say, I should point out here, when I say up, upper bound for general R, the, the expression is a bit ugly, so I did not want to include. Uh, what is perhaps more interesting is, is the techniques we are using. So we rely on uh, games between uh, the algorithm and the adversary using some, some information theoretic arguments. And uh, what I also think is interesting is that, that we try to relate the hint to multi-search strategies. So we pretend that there are a lot of searches who are searching at the same time, all of them being are robust. We will let the best one locate, uh, locate the target. So I will conclude with uh, someone going the future work. So it turns out that uh, this is a very simple setting and, 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 and uh, but the analysis is not exactly trivial. Uh, there are still upper and lower bounds. We still have some gaps and we're working towards uh, bridging these gaps. And uh, another, another interesting direction is incorporating errors in these predictions because in the real world, the predictions come with some errors. And uh, towards this direction with, uh, with Sain Kamani, we looked at an AI problem. Uh, so we looked at the problem of contract scheduling with predictions. Uh, and this is work that will appear in, in, in the next AAAI conference. And uh, we're very confident that uh, we can incorporate these ideas to this, problems, to this problem because, because they have conceptual similarities. Uh, we would like to study, of course, uh, randomized strategies. And the fourth direction is, I think, what is, uh, what, what is the most broad one. Uh, one could study uh, sets problems beyond the competitive ratio. You, know, you don't need to confine yourself to the competitive ratio for the studies of these problems. Uh, in particular, in, uh, in, uh, in operations research, uh, people um, study search uh, problems either as a search game between the hider and the searcher or as an optimization problem. So you have some distribution concerning the hider and you want to minimize the average uh, stun. And again, the same framework could be applied to, to this class of problems. So you don't have to use, you don't have to rely to the competitive ratio. So in this sense, I'm hopeful that this opens up a new way of um, looking into this class of problems. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Spiros. Uh, could you go ahead and deactivate your screen share so we can switch over to Young Wong? Uh, sure, oh, one second, please. Uh, I, yes. Uh, stop and Yang Wang, you should be able to share screen, I think. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, we have Yang Wang Shi on uh, online paging with Vanishing Regret. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Yang Wang Shi from Technio. Today, I will talk about online paging algorithms with Vanishing Regret. This is a joint research work with Professor Yuval Amak and Professor Shai Kutin from Technio. In the online paging problem, we are given a main memory of sets N and a cache of sets K. 
the request the uh, sequence over the hinges in the main memory come in an online fashion in capital T run. In each run T, if the requested page is not in the cache configuration, in such a case, we see a cache miss happens. For example, in this illustration, the cache miss doesn't happen in round one or round two, but it does happen in round three, because at round three, the tiger page is not in the cache configuration. And when the cache miss happens, we need to invoke an element in the cache configuration to bring the requested page in. For example, we can invoke this rabbit page to bring the tiger in, like this. And uh, for an arbitrary online page algorithm, its cost is defined to be the number of the cache misses incurred by this algorithm. And the objective is to minimize the number of the cache misses. For an arbitrary page i and a run t, we define the next URL time notch or i with respect to t to be the first run explicitly after t when the page i is requested. In Bernadette's work in 1966, it is proved that the offline optimum can always be achieved by an algorithm which always evicts the page with the largest notch when the cache miss happens. For example, in this illustration, when the cache miss happens at round one, the dark page it has the largest nut over all the pages in the cache configuration. So the algorithm fit F, the furthest in the future algorithm, it will invoke this dark page. And then for an arbitrary or online page algorithm arg, its regret is defined to be the difference between the cost of arg and the op offline optimum. Our goal is to design an online page algorithm with a vanishing regret which means that the ratio of the regret to the number of the runs capital T tends to be zero when the capital T tends to be infinity. However, this is impossible under the conventional setting. Consider an environment where n equals 2k plus one and the request sequence is generated at random uniformly and independently. It can be proved that in such a case, the expectation of the offline optimum has an upper bound of big O T over K low K. Meanwhile, the expected cost of any random algorithm arc has a lower bound of omega T over K. So in our study, we consider a setting where the online pigeon algorithm is given access to machine learning predictions. In particular, for a NAT predictor, it will generate prediction sequence in an online fashion for the NAT of the requested pages. For example, in this illustration, at round one, the tiger page is requested. Its real NAT would be three, which means that after round one, the first round when the tiger is requested would be round three. And meanwhile, the predictor will reveal a prediction to the uh, main algorithm eight. And obviously, it doesn't match the real NAT. For a predictor, we define its cumulative prediction error to be the number of the runs when the prediction doesn't match the real, uh, real NAT, like this run. And because the machine learning predictors, it can often be has a high cumulative prediction error, which means that it is not trusted. And in that case, in our study, we consider a setting where the main algorithm is given access to multiple predictors. And it can be implemented by machine learning algorithms that are trained on different data sets or using different machine learning models. For example, in this illustration, we give an uh, example of a different predictor which can generate different predictions over the nets and have different cumulative prediction errors. We make an assumption that if we are given multiple uh, accesses to multiple uh, predictors, then at least one of the predictors will have a low cumulative prediction error that is sublinear in capital T. And we call this assumption as the good predictor assumption. The question is, if this assumption holds, then whether we can get a vanishing regret. Before we describe our main results for this question, I want to talk something about the access model first. Because the predictions are revealed in an online fashion, there are two ways to define the access model to the prediction. The first one is called the full information access model. Under such a model, at every round, the prediction of all the predictors are revealed to the main algorithm. By contrast, in the second access model, in the bandit access model, in every round, the main algorithm needs to make a choice over the predictors. For example, in the first run, it can choose the predictor B, and in the second run, it can choose predictor A. 
and only the chosen predictor can reveal its prediction to the main algorithm. So obviously, from a technical perspective of view, the, this model will be more interesting but more challenging. Okay, now I will talk about our main results. And we will start from the setting with a single predictor. And we develop an algorithm same, which try to simulate the algorithm fit F, but replace the real net with the remedy prediction that is that are derived from the given predictions. And uh, it is defined in this way. And for example, at round one, the play, tiger page is requested and the predictor reveals a prediction two. And such a prediction can be found to be wrong at round two. And in such a case, we will update this prediction to be a large enough number Z that is larger than N. Because without such an operation, this tiger page will always remain in the cache configuration and never gets evicted and causes too many prediction errors. Uh, too many uh, costs. And uh, therefore, in, with such a technique, we can get a vanity regret that is bounded in this way for the single predictor setting. And now let's consider the multiple predictor setting and the full information access model. In such a setting, we can simulate our same algorithm with respect to each predictor in parallel. And for every such a same algorithm, we will track its cache configurations and costs and mix all these algorithms with a random online learning algorithm proposed by Blum and Birch in 2000. And to generate a, a vanishing regret bounded by such a formula. And I would like to emphasize that the algorithm proposed by Blum and Birch in 2000 requires us to track the states, I mean the cache configurations and the costs of every such algorithms, which is impossible under the bandit access model. So how could we deal with such an obstacle for the bandit access model? So we will uh, probably develop a new online learning algorithm, which doesn't require us to track the states, I mean the cache configurations of these algorithms. Instead, when the online learning algorithm, it chooses a new predictor, we do not uh, switch our cache configuration to the target algorithm. Instead, we will perform a chasing procedure. This chasing procedure, it may not catch up with the state, I mean the cache configuration or the target algorithm, but we can ensure that the, uh, relatively, the relative loss would be bounded. Just like this, like this illustration, this runner will be our chasing algorithm, chasing procedure, and this swimmer or this cyclist, it can be the target algorithm. And we will always compete over different states. But if we can try hard enough, then the, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't lose too much. And in this way, we can get a vanishing regret bounded by such a sublinear formula. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Yang Guang. Uh... We have one more talk, so if we could switch over to the last speaker, um, probably that's Samson. If you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay. And to all of the audience, remember that after this, we will have about maybe 15 minutes for some questions and discussion. So if you have questions, you can start thinking of them. You can start recording in the chat if you like. Uh, we have Samson from CMU to talk about sensitivity analysis of the maximum matching problem. Go ahead, Samson. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction, and this is joint work with Yuji Yoshida. Um, okay, so sensitivity is a uh, quantity that measures how much a discrete algorithm changes when the input changes. So for a uh, deterministic graph algorithm, A, on a graph G with N vertices, the average sensitivity is defined as the expectation of the size of the symmetric difference of um, the output of algorithm A on input G versus the output of algorithm A on G minus E, where E is taken from the edge set of G. For a randomized algorithm, we consider the expectation of the earth mover distance between the distributions of A rather than the uh, size of the symmetric difference. And um, I guess just to illustrate this definition, we'll give an example in which we consider the greedy algorithm for a maximal matching on a graph with six nodes. So suppose we consider the graph in the upper left corner. I claim that there exists an ordering of the edges for which the greedy algorithm gives the matching um, labeled in the two blue horizontal lines in the upper right corner. 
On the other hand, if we remove the middle horizontal edges and we preserve the ordering of the remaining edges, then the greedy algorithm will output a maximal matching indicated by the blue edges in the bottom right corner. So the symmetric difference of these two uh, matchings are the edges in red. So the size of the symmetric difference is three. So hopefully this gives some intuition on the definition. So average sensitivity for graph algorithms was introduced by Murai and Yoshida. And they considered a concept called centrality, which uh, quantifies how important a node is in a underlying network. Barman Yoshida subsequently studied a number of graph algorithms that output edge and vertex sets. And Peng and Yoshida considered um, average density for spectral clustering. We introduced the definition of worst case sensitivity. And that's basically just the average sensitivity, but we replaced the expectation with a max. This definition is pretty well motivated and it's related to other concepts that are important for uh, studying uh, online algorithms and dynamic algorithms. For example, consider a case where we have a number of uh, agencies that want to provide as much service to a number of clients as possible along um, a number of predetermined routes. So they choose a matching and then they, they uh, build some infrastructure to support this matching. But now later down the road, we have a new uh, possible route appear and we still want to maximize the matching, but we don't want to change as much uh, infrastructure. So we want to minimize the sensitivity of this graph. So the results I'll talk about today is first a one plus epsilon approximation to the maximum matching problem with uh, constant worst case sensitivity where we omit the dependencies on epsilon and a deterministic algorithm for maximal matching with worst case sensitivity delta to the x where delta is the uh, degree of the graph. So to give some context to our results, we improve on a previous result by Varma and Yoshida in two ways. The first way is that they uh, analyze the average sensitivity, whereas we analyze the worst case sensitivity. The second is that they get sensitivity roughly, you know, n to the epsilon cubed, where n is the number of edges, sorry, the number of vertices in the graph, whereas we get worst case sensitivity uh, of one. So how do we do this? I mean, the previous example already shows that greedy algorithm can have worst case sensitivity omega n. Well, the first idea is that we show that randomized greedy for maximal matching actually has sensitivity of one. So randomized greedy is where we first uh, randomly choose a permutation of the ordering of the edges, and then we just run the typical greedy algorithm. The idea is that the expected deleted added edge appears halfway through the ordering of the edges. So that seems bad at first because maybe we'll still need uh, sensitivity omega n, but the intuition is that either most of the edges in the matching occur either early in the ordering, if the underlying graph is a dense graph, or the deleted and added edge does not affect the edges in the matching very much if it's a sparse graph. Okay, so now we have a randomized greedy algorithm for maximal matching, and we want to go from maximal matching to one plus epsilon approximation for maximum matching. And we do this by modifying a layered graph that uh, McGregor showed in a multi-pass streaming algorithm model. So the layered graph creates a graph with L plus one layers to simultaneously sample a large number of augmenting paths of length L. So in this picture, we have um, the underlying graph of, uh, I guess, five edges, and the layered graph that shows an augmenting path in this, um, with respect to this map. The key concept is that if we terminate this um, approach in roughly one over epsilon iterations, then we achieve a one plus epsilon approximation because we've sampled most of the augmenting paths of length at least uh, one over epsilon. So if we do this k times, where k is some um, constant that depends only on epsilon but not n, then we get a worst case sensitivity of three to the k. Furthermore, the runtime is polynomial in n, m, and k. At a high level, that's our um, approximation algorithm to the maximum matching problem. And now we'll talk about a deterministic algorithm for maximal matching. Our deterministic algorithm has two ingredients. The first ingredient is a deterministic uh, local computation algorithm by Kwon Vishkin that produces a six to the delta coloring of a graph with degree delta. And the key part is that it uses O to the um, delta log star n queries. This algorithm works by partitioning the graph into forests, assigning each node a color based on the least significant bit, the difference between the node ID and the parent ID. 
And the key property that we use for this ingredient is that the deterministic LCA only queries vertices within distance uh, log star n. The second ingredient we'll use is a framework by Parnas and Ron that simulates local algorithms for maximal matchings using a deterministic LCA for graph coloring uh, with C colors. And uh, this framework uses delta to the O of C probes. Now this framework works by iterating through colors and adding edges to the maximum matching M if no adjacent edge is already in M. So one can think of this as like a greedy algorithm by iterating over colors. And the key property that we use for this algorithm is that the framework only queries vertices that are within, within distance six to the delta. So combining these two properties, we see that the at most delta to the quantity, six to the delta plus log star n queries can be uh, in the LCA can be affected by a single deletion or addition. And that gives our sensitivity. So those are two algorithms at a high level. We also have a number of algorithms, or a number of results that uh, include a lower bound for showing that um, any deterministic algorithm has worst case edge sensitivity omega of log star n as well as an upper bound that uh, considers a notion of uh, weighted sensitivity and normalized weighted sensitivity for uh, maximum weighted matchings. Since this is one of the first works that looks at worst case uh, sensitivity, there has been you know, already some subsequent work, but also we think there's a number of interesting future directions to, to look at. Um, I'll defer this to uh, the, uh, the, the long version of the talk. And thank you for listening. I hope you'll take a look at our paper. Thanks, Samson. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask everybody who has permissions to, to unmute themselves so we can offer some applause to all of the speakers for about 15 seconds. So if you could go ahead and unmute. Okay, thank you all for your enthusiastic participation. Uh, great. So we have now maybe 15 minutes um, in which, which to have some discussion. Both we can have questions from the audience for particular papers, um, but we also, I have a couple of um, panel discussion questions that I'd like to kick things off with. So, and uh, the, the panelists have not been warned of any of these questions. So these are for the, this is for the authors of all the papers. Um, feel free, you don't all have to answer, but uh, just to prompt discussion. So a recent theme in online algorithms, and we've seen it in a couple of papers in this session, has been um, the use of uh, untrusted or somewhat trusted advice to improve um, competitive ratios of online algorithms. And uh, I have two questions along those lines. One is for each of the authors some of you had papers specifically about this, but some of you had models discussed, discussed online algorithms which suffer from certain lower bounds. And I wonder if you have thoughts on whether having online advice in some of these models could help uh, circumvent these lower bounds. And the second is um, in this area, lots of different models and of what online advice should look like are floating around. And I don't think there's quite community consensus on what it should be yet. So I wonder if you could offer any thoughts on what makes a good model of online advice. What 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 conceptually should you check for when deciding if you've come up with a good mathematical model? So this is open to any author. Um, I realize you might want to take a moment to think. I, I may, uh, can I take the first shot, please? Yeah, please, um, please do. So it is, uh, because I have thought about these questions and you are right, um, there is an advice, in, 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 uh, in, in our field, in theoretical computer science, there is an advice framework for online algorithms, but it has assumed that the advice comes essentially from, uh, from it's perfect, it gives you all the information you want, and sometimes it's very unreasonable. So there are two, I think there are two directions one can pursue. You can look at a really syntactic model of advice and not an information theoretic model. And, and this is difficult. I, I, I don't know how this can be done, but it would be a good direction. For instance, there are syntactic models about classes of algorithms. There are models about uh, greedy-like algorithms. There's, a, there's, a, there's an entire framework that says what a greedy-like algorithm is uh, called priority algorithms. So there you can actually show lower bounds without complexity considerations. And perhaps one could use a similar, a similar model for, uh, for, for the advice framework. Uh, but this looks difficult. So, so to answer your question more directly, I would say, 
for upper bounds, we look at, at what algorithms we get if we get reasonable advice for our problem and, uh, and, and, and if, it, if, it's, uh, if it is robust. And for the lower bounds, if the information theoretic model works, great. If it doesn't work, so you have a huge gap, then you need to get more creative. Right? That, that, that is what I would say. So information theoretic model here means like uh, the advice is a bit string, not like the like one of the models that you consider. Yeah, but also the, the, the information theoretic model gets into two, for instance, you can get algorithms that are non-uniform uh, for different sizes of the input with different things. We don't have algorithms that work like that. So I don't want to have a framework that gets me to do all the, all the nasty work information theoretic and you to filter out these things. I would like to have a different model for that, but it's not obvious how to do it. Mm. I use. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, maybe I. I mean, I haven't thought about that myself, but um, yeah, maybe I can at least mention a, a paper in Europe this year that uh, looks at machine learning advice for the secretary problem, which is at least closely related to what I talked about. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, and then of course that's uh, that's a way to mitigate strong lower bounds on on online algorithms. But I think a, a different way is actually through um, some profit inequality type of model, which has been looked at. So if if you assume that the um, the requests don't are not generated by an adversary, but the the adversary rather generates a, a distribution from which then uh, um, the inputs draw. So yeah, I think. This has been looked at for, I don't know, for online web type matching and so on, but I think there's still, yeah, I think there's still a lot of room for uh, for these types of results. Actually, that, that leads me to a question specifically for you, Kevin, which is, I think I got from your talk that uh, as soon as you leave this IID setting, all just going to say exchangeable random variables, already you encounter very strong impossibility results. So um, impossibility. Uh, we, I mean, this is actually, we only looked at exchangeable random variables for, um, yeah, I mean, this as an extension of the setting without samples, because I think in, okay. we didn't really come up with a, with a model that makes sense to, that introduces samples in the, uh, in the general exchangeable setting. Yeah. Okay. 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 That makes sense. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So um, yeah, also on the first question related to the um, metrical service systems with transformations. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that uh, this can work here uh, because um, also, well, this year, well, last year, I guess, with a different set of co-authors, I had a paper at ICML where we show four metrical task systems. Uh, we propose a prediction framework and show that you can do something for arbitrary metrical task systems, which in particular means you can do something for metrical service systems. Um, so it does seem plausible that also if you add these transformations, you can probably still uh, make use of predictions. But I, yeah, I haven't thought about it in detail, so, but it, it seems possible at least, yeah. Very cool. Uh, and, uh... Yeah, go ahead. Yes. And uh, so it seems that the first question has been talked about extensively talked. So I want to talk something about your second question. I mean, what would be a good model for the advices? And uh, yes, in because in our paper, we actually consider that we have multiple sources of the advices. And such um, such kind of setting, I mean, if, if we only consider a single source of the advices, then such a setting has already been extensively studied for the online page problem or the, for the metrical state, multi, uh, metrical service problem or metrical task system problems. Yes, and uh, but the problem is that in these papers, we, we can always find different definitions about how the advices is different, defined. For example, we can define the advice to be the notch or, to, or something like the uh, state of the optimal algorithm. And yes, but 
I think that we need a more general definition about the advices. I mean, a definition of the advices that can hold in a general way that for the not application dependent uh, on them problems. For example, in our study, we consider a setting where we are given the explicit advices, which means that we are just given the predictions of the whole uh, request sequence. And uh, such a setting, of course, it doesn't depend on the real problem. I mean, it doesn't depend on paging problem. It doesn't depend on whether we are having an MTS problem and so on. And uh, we call it the explicit, uh, explicit predictor setting. And uh, such a setting is, is general. And we hope that such a setting can be also studied and, uh, the, uh, and the other problems. And we actually get some good results for such a problem. But the problem for, for this setting, but the problem is that for such a setting, we cannot expect that the predictions are given in an online fashion. Because suppose that for the online paging problem, if we at the round one, we are given, we are just given the prediction for the page that is requested at round one. Such a prediction makes no sense because we are we are just get the, the request at such at the current round. So we need to re, uh, assume that we can get the predictions in an offline setting, in an offline manner. All the predictions, uh, all the advices are given at the beginning. So this would be some disadvantage of such a general model. And uh, yes, and uh, I think that we will, we would continue to study this, um, this area. Yes, thank Thanks. you. So before the session officially ends at 12:30, I want to make sure we have at least a moment for some questions for the from the uh, from the audience. So I already I saw a hand from uh, Mayank Baskar. Mayank, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah. Hi. I had a, a, a general query uh, with respect to the uh, this online class of uh, problems for the optimization perspective. So. I was just you know, thinking, what uh, uh, strategies do the panelists think uh, uh, think are the most uh, 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 impactful in terms of uh, uh, taking the priors out of the offline uh, algorithms and tuning it with respect to those online uh, and, uh, uh, and, and data flows that. Uh, 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 come along and maybe uh, also try some sort of a uh, distribution shift with respect to the uh, uh, and, uh, data uh, in the case of suppose if I take uh, 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 federated and, and learning for example. So I was thinking more in terms of optimizing these sort of approaches and what uh, do the panelists think? So I, I think the question has to do with uh, bringing online optimization strategies into the uh, offline optimization strategies into the online um, setting and how to deal with maybe distribution shift over time there. Uh, yes, yes, in short, yeah. It's a big, it's a big, uh, big question. Yeah, it's a uh, general query. So I was thinking if analysts have time. Well, let's let's also remember that there, uh, for for queries that maybe require some offline thinking, there are Slack channels for all of these papers, um, for for discussion. But we'll. Good. Um, okay, I, everyone is welcome to hang around, but I should tell you now that it's 1230. So um, officially the coffee break is starting in Gather Town. Um, I am happy to hang out here for another five minutes or so if anyone would like to ask more questions of the panelists. Um, I have more questions for a few of you if you want to hang out, but I can also write you on Slack. Um, Christian, can I ask you, uh, so I don't know anything about this uh, K taxi problem, but just intuitively, why is why is poly n a reasonable kind of guarantee here? Like, if I really think of it in terms of how it's named, somehow I think of the metric space as having many that a taxi lives on as having many more points than the number of taxis. So 
poly n and log k seems like a weird combination. Yeah, right. I see. Because you ex because in general n is going to be much bigger than yeah. I think k. of the metric space as being bigger. So can you right. can you hope to improve this poly n, or can you maybe uh, have a more structured metric space and then get a get the poly n down to poly log n or something? Yeah. So I don't think that this upper bound that we have is tight. So that there was a previous bound on this k taxi problem where we showed um, like in a different paper two to the k log n which is more in line with what one would expect. So compared to that, we have a double exponential improvement on the k dependence, but we're exponentially worse in terms of the n dependence. And the reason we get this is because we take this approach that we model the k-taxi problem as like we, we view it as a metric service system with transformations. And then we get a metric space that has k to the n uh, many points basically. Because we, we have to look at the configuration space rather than the, so, so there is an endpoint metric space for the taxi problem. But if we model it as a metric service system with transformations, then for this problem, it's a metric space with k to the n many configurations. And then we extend the space so that we can uh, extend these isometries to global isometries. And this makes it a 2k to the n size space roughly. And yeah, then the poly log of that is is giving the the log of um, of n and log k. Uh, well, the polynomial in n and log k. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I also have a question that's for both Yang Wang and Spiros, and then maybe we'll let everybody go because we're running over time. Um, which is in both of your papers, you have this advice notion, and in both cases, I think there's some sense in which if the advice is not exactly right. The, the algorithm reverts to some worst case kind of behavior. So in Yang Guang's paper, I think one, one thing I mean by this is that um, if the next arrival time is not exactly right for a page, um, that's, you know, the algorithm basically gives up uh, on using that, uh, that advice. That's my impression, understanding anyway. But it intuitively seems like, you know, suppose I get the next arrival time almost right, like I'm off by one or something. Like somehow that seems like it should still be useful information. And I'm wondering if, and Spiros, you sort of brought this up at the end of your talk in terms of having approximately correct hints. I wonder if either or both of you could comment on whether that's conceivable to use sort of information which is almost right, but not quite. Uh, well, in fact, in, our, in my study, we consider that uh, I, we, are, we are given a sufficiently many predictors and uh, so you know, maybe some of them will have a high uh, prediction error. It is not very accurate and has many, many errors and we cannot sufficiently utilize its information, yes. But we assume that at least one of them has a very low cumulative prediction errors, which means that we can always optimize, we can, the, the, optimal, the optimal algorithm can always optimize the information from this predictor and uh, not optimal, but our benchmark, the benchmark can uh, optimize the information from this predictor. And also, I want to say that when, even if we are given a wrong uh, nut, even if it is very wrong, we will still perform some operations based on this uh, nut of this page. But we will correct our uh, mistake for in the future. For example, uh, at some run t, we make a, a wrong operation for some, by evicting some good pages. And then after 10 rounds or after 20 rounds, we find, uh, we find that, oh, the, that, that run prediction about the nut is wrong and I need to correct my mistake. So this, uh, I will try to update the prediction to be a large enough number, which doesn't make much sense so that the page with a wrong prediction can be evicted as soon as possible. So that's what we can do. And we find that it can work if the predict it can help us to ensure that the pre our, our cost our the loss of our of our algorithm or the regret of our algorithm can be bounded with the prediction errors. And uh, this is for the single prediction setting. And so if we are given multiple predictors, and then in such a case, we our algorithm will make switches between the predictors. I mean we is suppose that we have all the information in for the predictors, 
then we will track the status the stage states of these of, of these predictors and uh, jump over these predictors to to get a uh, uh, low cost and uh, yes that's what we do so we will try to find which one would has a uh, would can give us the best advices, which predictor can give us the best. We are trying to explore this. So, so I guess should, uh, also, should I say something on, on this? Sure, so, if you feel like it, no obligation. Uh, if, if you want, I can answer, I can try yeah. to answer your question. And yeah, that would be so, great. so if I understand correctly, you're saying, okay, so what happens if you incorporate errors really and what changes? Yeah, you know, suppose I, I give you a hint, but I, you know, in your, in your simple example where the hint is a location on the line, you know, I'm off by epsilon. You're right. So, so there are some cases where you're going to be off by a lot. So this doesn't help. In fact, this is addressed in the other paper uh, that we had a, a little bit subsequently to ITCS. Uh, and, and, and there we did look at, we did exactly that. So, so we said there are situations where you, if you are off by a little, then this, this Pareto uh, relations break down, mm. but you have also to consider what you do in this case. So if you don't, you have now three parameters to jungle, if you, the, the, the two extreme, the consistency interval buses, and you have also what happens with, uh, in, in the between what, when you have some so error. Partially okay. correct hint. So juggling all three is by itself difficult. And it's even more difficult, and I explained to you why, because the problems at least I consider here are non-monotone with error. So, so let me give you an example. So you could have a horrible strategy in which you walk too much towards in one direction and you, and you come back, okay? You can have an, a, 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 a prediction that is awful, so it points you to, to a completely wrong spot and you have huge noise and you get, you get the, 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 what you get as prediction is right at the point you were turning in this awful strategy. So your awful strategy with horrible error is perfect. So if you want to, if you want to filter out these things, you sort of can, and, and we do this in the paper and I actually I would, I would be happy to explain you where we do. The statements of the results are more tricky than the, the results themselves because you have to think about how to what mm -hmm. you can say in this context and what kind of relations you can do so it's uh, at least for this kind of problems that they consider is a little bit is tricky more in terms of modeling than in terms of uh, the results. Actual, uh, for the yeah. for the query model it is a very interesting open problem that i don't know yet how to solve all, all these things uh, there it becomes even more uh, then it becomes a real problem it is it is the relationship between, if you don't want to rely on, bin on, on noisy binary sets, you have to do something else. And that's on the very high level. Um, yeah, I'd be happy Super to cool. point out exactly. Um, I think for, for the time being, we should probably adjourn and let people go to the coffee break. Uh, thank you again to all the speakers. You're all awesome. And I will see you around. <laughs>